Hi, everyone. This is Ari Yu, Chair of the Cascadia Blockchain Council, and your host for the Blockchain Underground and Windshield Time podcast. Today, we had a really great guest from Senator Chris Rothfuss from Wyoming. He talked to us all about the stuff that's going on in Wyoming, gave us a lot of insights into the industry, and I really hope you learned as much as I did. Remember, we have these AMAs, Ask Me Anythings, every Friday from 12 to 1 p.m. PST. You can find us on Meetup under blockchain underground uh, don't forget to rate review subscribe and share and together we rise bye all right thanks everyone for joining um, we have a very special guest today from wyoming senator chris rothfuss I'm really, really excited to be with him and uh, get to ask him all sorts of questions, as I'm sure you are. Uh, Chris, do you want to kick it off with a quick, not quick, actually go for the long form introduction <laughs> of yourself, because I know it's sure. really, really interesting and fascinating. And uh, um, yeah, tell us about yourself. Absolutely. And really, I'm happy to be here and have this discussion. I look forward to the conversation and questions. But um my background, I, I grew up in Wyoming and, and uh, went to the University of Wyoming and uh, uh, then went to actually out where you're at uh, for my uh, master's degree and PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, so I, I did work in um, both chemical engineering and applied physics at that time and uh, some nanoscale research that, that led me to go into policy a little bit. I, I took a AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science Fellowship at the Department of State when I finished my PhD and ended up in the Office of Space and Advanced Technologies, uh, working on nanotechnology foreign policy and then space policy and uh, had a few years at the State Department um, as a foreign affairs officer and science and technology policy advisor. And then uh, we actually had little kids. We came back to Wyoming to raise our, our family here. And uh, since we came back in 2007, I've continued as a policy advisor and advanced technology consultant, uh, a faculty member at the University of Wyoming in the Honors College. And then also since 2010, I was first elected to the Wyoming legislature uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been the Senate Minority Leader in the Wyoming Legislature. So I've, I've had uh, a good bit of politics and a good bit of, of science and engineering as my background. And for the past then a uh, little over five years, we've been heavily involved in Wyoming in trying to develop a regulatory and legal framework for digital assets, cryptocurrency, blockchain transactions. And, and so it's, it's been very interesting for those past five years, bringing in the technology expertise uh, from my career and, and education and training into policy here in the Wyoming legislature. Wow, this is really, really interesting background. Um, you know, one of my uh, big complaints um, is that we need more policymakers that are tech savvy. So do you actually find that it's been very helpful to you or, or I mean, what is, how's your tech background helped you or not helped you? Yeah, that's actually one of my little soapbox pitches. And I end up giving a lot of talks to engineers and, and to scientists. And I always tell them to run for office or, or get into policy because we, we truly need more and more and more science, engineering, and technological expertise involved in these policymaking decisions. Uh, so that was the purpose of this AAAS fellowship that I took, which is designed to get PhD engineers and scientists into federal policy positions. Uh, but a lot of times those are in advisory roles. Uh, we need folks that are tech savvy in the decision-making positions and I, I'd love to have, you know, I don't care what political party, political persuasion, political beliefs, I, I would love to have far more policymakers that, that truly understand the science and technology that underlies a lot of what we're developing through economic development, through policy, through, through everything else that we do, it would, it would certainly help. And I, I value my expertise in education tremendously when I'm, when I'm working in policy. Oh man, here, here. Um, Senator, so Wyoming has passed a lot of the uh, um, 
initial and also pioneering legislation in the world of digital assets. Do, are the other legislative policymakers as tech savvy as you are? Is it the education's better or like what was the who what was the makeup of the folks that were leading this that made it happen here in Wyoming? Uh, honestly, we had a little bit of luck bringing together a, a good team of people early on, which is is always the key. Um, I had done work previously in cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology with some consulting work um, back in like 2013-ish that that era um another legislator who is now actually a chief of policy for senator cynthia lummis who is is trying to lead some of this policy charge at the federal level to provide a, appropriate regulatory structure for cryptocurrencies and and digital assets um he was representative tyler lindholm at the time uh he has been a cryptocurrency enthusiast since uh, I think the, the beginning of, of Bitcoin, uh, an early adopter. So the two of us kind of came together on a little bit of a challenge um, that was a dates back to about 2015, I think, when a constituent of mine, oddly enough, went to former representative Lindholm and said, hey, I, I can't, um, I can't use Bitcoin in Wyoming because Coinbase wouldn't operate here at the time. And, and uh, what can you do about it? One of those, you know, there ought to be a law, go talk to your legislator and complain. And, and, uh, and uh, what we found out, uh, you know, Tyler came and chatted with me and we looked into it a little bit and found out that it was an interpretation of something called the Money Transmitters Act, the Wyoming Money Transmitter Act. All 50 states have some version of the Wyoming Money Transmitters Act, um, although I, I think Montana actually deleted theirs a few years ago, which is a whole separate story. Uh, but <laughs> our interpretation was just awkward in a way that required a fiat funding of the equivalent value of any digital currency transaction if you were using a third party uh, at, like Coinbase. And, and so as a, as a result, Coinbase wouldn't operate in Wyoming, which made sense. Uh, so we started looking into it. What you do when you, when you craft legislation typically is you figure out which state's doing something well, and then you just copy and paste their legislation, right? It's uh, <laughs> like any other good work. Begin with plagiarism, right? You know, code, whatever <laughs> else you're working with, just to start and see what other people did well. And we quickly found that, uh, that nobody was doing anything well, that, that any state that was operating in what you would call a correct manner was doing it simply by luck and by arbitrary interpretation of statutes they had on their books. Our poor performance was equally based on luck and arbitrary interpretations of a poorly understood technology. Uh, so we thought, this was an opportunity and a, a, a space for Wyoming to really be pioneering and, and instrumental in shaping future policy. Uh, I think we talked before about the fact that Wyoming is, is very dependent on coal, oil, and gas for our, our revenue as a state. Uh, we're a mineral extractive state, and we're looking for a good 21st century industry that we can engage in to diversify our economy away from uh, what are effectively antiquated industries that, that are waning as, as the years pass and, and looking forward into something that is emergent. And so we saw this opportunity and we put together a team early on of, of key stakeholders. That's where you, you get you know, Caitlin Long, uh, Matt Kaufman, uh, an attorney from Cheyenne, uh, David Pope, uh, who you know, uh, we, a, a good group of um, early adopters and experts in this space. And through that group and through some other legislators that we effectively handpicked that may not have known anything in particular about cryptocurrency or digital assets at the time, but they were forward-looking legislators that were willing to solve some problems. We, we developed a task force at first, and now we have a permanent select committee that I, I co-chair along with now representative Jared Olson um, 
from the House. And, and again, this is bipartisan. I'm the minority leader. Uh, my co-chair from the House is, is the majority whip over in the House. And, uh, you know, politics in terms of, of what party are you, it doesn't really come into this discussion very much. We have a very libertarian leaning population in Wyoming that, that kind of likes small government, privacy, individual rights. And so it really doesn't matter where you're coming from. This, this space of digital assets is, is something where we can all kind of get together and, and agree. And that's led us to passing over 30 pieces of legislation related to digital assets. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, my jaw's on the floor when you say like 33 <laughs> pieces of legislation. It's, it's really, really amazing. Um, so many questions. Um, and I will open it up to Kumi, I promise. Yeah. Um, so, oh, which one? Um, let's see. Do you personally, I it look like Cynthia Loomis is uh, Bitcoin because she's got the laser eyes and all that. Yeah, yeah, on. yeah, yeah. How about for yourself? Are you Bitcoin? Are you blockchain? Or are you crypto? So I am, I am all things. I, I, I support the Bitcoin community. I support any alternative currency. I, I see a technology here. Again, I, I'm a technology advisor mm. and spend a lot of time in this space from the technology standpoint. Uh, when I saw potential for the state of Wyoming, I certainly saw potential for things like cryptocurrency mining and Bitcoin, but I also see uh, smart contracts, property rights, transactional certainty, uh, good governance, authoritative contracts. There, there are so many different pieces of what we do that can be optimized and improved upon through blockchain transactions and, and through smart contract enablement. Uh, you look at DAOs, for example, Wyoming, uh, as of the July 1st, 2021, we became the first state to formally recognize DAOs. So there's a technology obviously enabled um, through cryptocurrencies and blockchain and smart contracts, bringing together these incredible puzzle pieces. Well, I wanna make sure that we also have through the state of Wyoming, a recognition of digital identity uh, and, and appropriate respect for property rights and privacy rights associated with those digital identities uh, and transaction authority, where you have the capacity through some sort of e-residency uh, validation through the state of Wyoming, um, that if you are engaging in a transaction, whether that's in Wyoming or elsewhere in the world, the state of Wyoming can authoritatively say, yes, Ari, it is you. Uh, we, this is your public key on record with the state of Wyoming. Uh, you are definitively a 22.7% owner in this DAO. This DAO is organizationally identified through the Secretary of State in the, in the state of Wyoming. All of those kinds of things just enable a much better uh, commerce space, but also enable individuals to be authoritative on their own behalf, which is something that I, I truly see as an advantage of moving in this direction. We rely right now on financial institutions and government institutions uh, and commerce institutions where we really have no say and we have no authority and we have no control. It'd be nice if we did. I think you have to get up into the billionaire space before you can actually really have have kind of control over what's going on. It would be tremendous if we had some individual authority, which can be enabled through these technologies. So I have a, another side question. So you talked about uh, Wyoming having, having a uh, libertarian perspective or coloring to the policymakers. Um, and I, uh, I interface with a lot of different states. So I look at Oregon and they have a, uh, very hands-off approach to policy making. They feel like, uh, you know, you don't want to over-legislate, you just only fix things that are broken. Did you find that something was, I mean, you found the original Coinbase problem to be broken, but now are you over-legislating, do you think? Or do you think this legislating needs to happen? Um, because that's that's getting more hands-on than, yeah. yeah we, this, is a, this is a great discussion. And this is one that we had people come in and, and early on with our select committee on task force saying, hey, stop regulating, stay out of it. There were, there were some folks that, that provided that perspective and that point. Um, 
we have as a philosophy on this select committee, it's sort of our mantra, we are regulating to enable rather than regulating to restrict. We're not trying to hold anything back, but there are many circumstances where you need a bank to be able to bank you and to have the authority to do so because there's institutional confidence and trust in the operations that you want to do in, in, the, in your corporation. You want to have clarity where you can go to an investor and say, yes, this is legal. Yes, there are legal specific bright lines that show that what we're doing is a valid business model, a DAO, for example, where you're delegating authority to algorithm. Uh, as, as I often say, nobody wants to bring capital to a business proposal that might be legal, right? You want to be able to go to someone and say, yes, in, in Wyoming, digital assets have legal standing pursuant to the Uniform Commercial Code. This is exactly how they're treated. Wyoming courts have bright lines that indicate that property can be contemplated through traditional precedent in these ways. Mm -hmm. The state of Wyoming has a chancery court to allow expertise to be brought to bear on complicated problems. Mm -hmm. So if, if folks just want to stay out of the system and, and really not be directly regulated, then rest assured we're not doing anything to hold anybody back we're not mm -hmm. providing any thou shalts we're not trying to to make people's lives more difficult or 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 onerous or layer on taxes or anything along those lines right we saw that in other states we saw new york for example with their bit license and we see a lot of discussions at the federal level right now trying to come up with ways to hold back the development of these technologies that's not what we're looking at we're looking at ways to provide clarity where questions are apparent and we're listening to the stakeholder community as we do it. So our ideas are not coming from us saying, well, it's, it's finally time that we write some laws to hold people back. It's coming mm -hmm. from stakeholder communities like cryptocurrency miners that, that come to Wyoming and say, hey, we've got a problem. Here's what we need. Okay. What are your problems? What holds you back? Or mm -hmm. we've got cryptocurrency companies or blockchain companies that literally couldn't be banked because the FDIC at the federal level would see the word blockchain in their title and would say, I'm sorry, you know, yeah. as, as a bank, we won't bank you because the, the FDIC says that we shouldn't trust you. You're sketchy, dodgy, and, and apparently you're all about money laundering. So we, <laughs> we won't give you an account. Well, if you can't be banked, you can't really have a business. So we heard that loud and clear, and that was the reason why we created the Special Purpose Depository Institution, which was the first type of bank charter, new type of bank charter in, in several decades. And it provided an opportunity to create a banking institution that did not require FDIC insurance mm -hmm. because it was 100% reserve. And at the same time, we enabled that bank to simultaneously custody digital assets, which is not allowed in any other state. So you have a banking institution in Wyoming now, uh, and we've got several chartered speedy banks where they can simultaneously custody digital assets and fiat currency. So it comes to breaking down barriers to adoption as opposed to finding ways to provide restrictions. And uh, honestly, that first person that kind of came in and said, you know, we don't need laws, this is all working just fine. Uh, they, they left that multi-day meeting saying, all right, I, we, we understand. I, I see what you're doing here and thank you. Mm, so fascinating. Um, to the, you mentioned the federal policies and the, um, I guess the whiplash and uh, discussions that are going on at the federal level. Um, I think technology should be nonpartisan. You said bipartisan. Um, and we had a little bit of, um, Republican versus Democrat, um, I guess, narratives going back and forth, especially over the last six months. Uh, why do, do you have insight into why and what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think nonpartisan, you're, you're right. That would be a, a better way to, to have it go. Um, if we could get there in, in general, I think nonpartisan is the way to go, period. I'm the minority leader, but if I could 
wave a wand and make the parties go away. I'd probably do that pretty happily. Um, there, there's an odd alignment and there are, there are different factions, I would say, in each of the major political parties uh, supporting or opposing digital assets and cryptocurrency, depending on which interest groups back them. Mm -hmm. You know, traditionally large financial institutions have opposed a lot of these technologies because they're disruptive and they take away the control and authority of traditional large financial institutions over financial transactions. When you don't need them anymore, that's a threat to their business model. So you have policymakers, and this is on both sides of the aisle, that, that tend to be friends with these large financial institutions that want to support those institutions. And, and so they come out with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so anybody that's, that's backed by banks is, is probably going to come out as a first approximation uh, as, well, we, we don't like cryptocurrency. And, and then they'll pitch all of the money laundering. And uh, this, this is great for drug traffic and terrorism and, and all of the, the things that we hear as, as the first line of uh, you know, folks coming forward with their pitchforks forks and torches on, on almost any new technology. Uh, at the same time, you, you have a lot of the underlying interests of both political parties and, and sort of the grassroots interests, uh, small government concepts and independence concepts, uh, free speech and privacy concepts. So these shine through in certain constituencies of both political parties from the, from the grassroots level. So it's interesting to see this play out from a political standpoint where you have champions in both political parties at the national level, and you have detractors in both political parties at the national level of the major political parties. Uh, and then you also obviously have a, you know, a, a lot of libertarian uh, support for this. I actually don't think I've seen any, any hardcore libertarians coming out against um, anything in blockchain or, or crypto space. That'll be a first when I do, but um, we actually in Wyoming, we have a, a colleague of mine in the Wyoming house is um, a, a libertarian um, representative here in Wyoming. And, and he's been a, a good advocate for all of the work that we've been doing as well. Uh, typically supportive. Um, but again, it comes down to these interest, this interesting confluence of interests. So with Sen Senator Lummis, for example, uh, is teaming up with some pretty interesting other uh, senators from my party um, at the national level and forming these great collaborative efforts to advance what I would call, you know, more appropriate blockchain, cryptocurrency, and digital asset regulatory structures. Because again, and, and just candidly, the staff that is working on Cynthia, Senator Lummis's legislation, uh, those are folks that came from our legislative service office at, at the Capitol in Cheyenne that were uh, instrumental in drafting and working on the legislation that we put forward. So this is a lockstep approach where Senator Lummis is basically bringing forward the same ideas I'm championing here as the minority leader of the Wyoming legislature, which is let's make sure that we're not regulating to hold things back, that we're regulating to enable and so you'll see that as a common theme, and you'll see a lot of, of mirroring of the approaches that we've taken in Wyoming that can enable that in the legislation that she will be bringing forth, which again, forth, which again is bipartisan legislation and, and will certainly not just be a Republican-led endeavor, uh, but will be hopefully uh, some good legislation that has equal numbers of, of R's and D's and and I's and L's and anything else you want to put after it. Uh, I guess one more question, um, yeah. and then I'll open it up to the community. What are the uh, most, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, 
most easily digested talking points that you've used to uh, win, win, you know, your colleagues over um, on this front? Like, what do they sound like? It, it's a, it's a great question. I, the first is obviously that this is the future of financial technology and of transaction space. Uh, Wyoming was the inventor in the 70s, 1974, of the Limited Liability uh, Corporation, the LLC. And this is a space that, that we could again put ourselves in, position ourselves as a state of being a leader in future technology with, with fintech and with business and innovation. And we need to find a space as the state of Wyoming that's forward looking to move into and, and develop a leadership role. Because honestly, we need to provide opportunity for our younger generation that is not going to end up working in coal mines, in oil fields, or in natural gas. Folks that want to be able to come back to Wyoming and have good work, good jobs, but that's going to be in technology uh, more than certainly in the past. So that's something that really resonates, I think, with everybody in Wyoming is this idea, idea of trying to work in a forward-looking space. Uh, there certainly is and has been at all times concern along the same lines of these these traditional responses to cryptocurrencies of fear, uncertainty, and doubt among my legislative colleagues, right? Well, isn't this good for money laundering? And I mean, the answer really that we've seen reports just recently, the answer is no, it's, it's pretty darn bad for money laundering, actually. And I tend to just try and explain to people, you know, if you want to launder money, you're still way better off with the giant briefcase of $100 bills. It's, it's the best way uh, to do any of the bad things that, that are otherwise talked about, a, 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 particularly when we're contemplating in a transparent public blockchains, as most of the ones that we deal with, uh, provide a full transaction record. That's just not the best way to, to do these nefarious things. And um, so it's a balance of trying to demonstrate the value of new technologies, how smart contracts and ease of business and ease of finance can benefit individuals in Wyoming, can create jobs, create economic development, while at the same time assuaging those concerns that make headlines but don't make sense. Very, very uh, interesting. And thank you so much for sharing, uh, Senator. I'm uh, going to open it up to the community for questions. I know we had a Great. bunch in the chat uh, as you were speaking. Um, but if anybody wants to use the reactions button at the end bottom of the Zoom window, uh, just raise your hand and we can call you up to ask a question. Otherwise, I'll start reading off some of the commentary. Sure. Uh, Richard wrote, I see parallels between traditional banking versus crypto banking and traditional music industry versus online music. Marina is um, has a professional crush on you. She says, can we borrow you for a year, please? Or even for a month to completely change our world, please? <laughs> Thank just, you, Marina. I, understand. I, I known Caitlin since 2004. And I made a bet with her that the, you couldn't possibly have a smarter legislatures in Wyoming. <laughs> I lost her a lot of bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm amazed. And, you know, I do know a bunch of legislature, obviously, because I'm one of the founding members of a free state project. Uh -huh. And we, we have elected, like, I don't know, 60 people by now. But nothing to you. And most of them are my fr close friends. Nothing to <laughs> you. Like. I just, I, I would love for you. To be able to say to my legislature, just listen to this guy for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want me to come out and chat with someone or, or have a conversation well, and just try and put it in legislative terms, I'm happy to. Because I can't make sense with them. They, 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 I must be speaking a different English. They, 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 their comprehension doesn't even come close. And sometimes comes to, you know, certainly not a physical fist fight, but feels that way when <laughs> Our Pocahontas senator calls Howard police on me. 
you know, it's, it's, it, 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 I'm just amazed at, at, at your level of understanding and comprehension. Well, thank you. Sorry. Appreciate that. Um, there was a question on your thoughts on CBDC, central bank digital currencies. How do you feel about them? <laughs> well, I think they're inevitable. So it almost it doesn't matter how we feel about them. I, I hope they're done in, again in a way that is enabling rather than restrictive. Um, we had a piece of legislation this session that passed both chambers and was just a couple of days ago vetoed, much to my dismay, by the governor, uh, which was our Wyoming version of a CBDC, uh, where we would, were going to issue a stable token, which was uh, a US dollar held in trust by the state of Wyoming uh, in exchange for a stable token. That token would be a digital representation of it. So effectively a stable coin, but uh, the as a stable token, it's a representation of the dollar itself as opposed to its own currency equal to a dollar. Um, the idea there was really just to kick this thing along and get it to the point where anybody could be engaging in uh, smart contract transactions immediately using something that is an equivalent to a, a fiat. Uh, and we're hearing from stakeholders, and you are all as well, just concern about you know the confidence in various stable tokens or stable coins, this will resolve itself over time. But one of the challenges for Wyoming and a CBDC would, would resolve this just as well as, as long as it was a, like US Federal Reserve or EU or uh, a, an institution that the state could have full confidence in. It's hard for the state of Wyoming to accept cryptocurrency, not logistically, but from a constitutional standpoint, we we can't have variable value assets coming to the state of Wyoming for payment of taxes or or your license fees, right? So this is a real struggle for us. Is just the how how can we take crypto? Not you know we can set up a wallet account tomorrow uh, and address and and take crypto. So what we end up talking about doing for transactions is immediate liquidation so that crypto comes in, we immediately mm -hmm. liquidate that into fiat, mm -hmm. and then we've got fiat dollars. Well, that candidly is just lame, right? That's, that's a <laughs> poor solution when the technology allows so much better. Mm -hmm. So I don't want CBDCs or anything like what I was just talking about if we were, if we were to issue a Wyoming stable token. I don't want that to replace any of this other innovation. I want it to further enable that and just support it so that if you want to transact in this CBDC, great, or the Wyoming stable token, that's great too. It would allow us as the state to easily engage in transactions, but I don't want anyone to feel obligated to use that. And, and I don't want to hedge out other innovative products because the innovation is not going to be with the government, right? We're not going to innovate. Uh, when it comes to technology. So what we have to be thoughtful of is don't stifle innovation. And so there's my concern with the CBDC is that it's overly privacy restrictive. So you, you know, so that it's really to track you more than it is to help you, uh, that it then becomes a mandate instead of an alternative where, well, hey, you've got this digital currency, so use it instead of Bitcoin or use it instead of Ethereum, um, or the idea that it would push out new technologies or new innovation. Um, if, if done right, it should support. And that was certainly what we were trying to do with our stable token. And we'll continue work on that for the next year. Um, the governor provided some concerns along with the veto. Uh, Im implied that he liked the concept, but that he was concerned about the ability to implement it in the near future. I had a rather aggressive timeline. Apparently it was um, aggressive enough to be scary. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'm gonna give the microphone to Richard because Marina, you just uh, spoke and then we'll go back to you. Okay, Marina. So uh, Richard, uh, would you come on mic, mic uh, on the video and then uh, do a one sentence introduction of yourself and then uh, ask Hi. a question. Hi, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, 
I've been involved in crypto for about 10 years. I kind of just was an observer for a while. Just, I wasn't sure like a lot of people at first. So I kind of sat back and educated myself, but then I, I dove in, I, I went all in, so to speak. So um, it's, you know, been a roller coaster ride, I think for everybody. So my question to you is, um, I talk to a lot of people and when I talk to them about cryptocurrency and DeFi and the whole, the whole technology thing, I, you know, friends and family alike, they roll their eyes and I, I had to laugh because I was, I watched that, uh, ep that movie that was made the South Park and there was a reference to crypto as being a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I laughed. I don't know if anybody else caught that. Um, but anyway, that, that I get that same reaction from a lot of people. So how do you, in your realm of influence, your, your sphere of influence, the people that you deal with in the political arena, how do you convince them that crypto is a good thing? Well, one of the things I do, Richard, and I appreciate that question is, so I am a professor and I, I teach in the Honors College and I teach courses on advanced technologies and teach for the engineering college as well. And um, I spend a lot of time really just trying to answer questions and educating in the same way that I, I do as a professor in the classroom. Uh, here's how it works. And then just keep hanging on with them for all the whys they want to ask. And well, does it do this? No. Does it do that? Yes. How? And then I show them. And it, it takes a long time. Um, one of the things that I think is a challenge, I think this gets back to what Marina was asking a few minutes ago as well with other legislators. It's hard to have enough time with legislators or policymakers to actually change their mind on something that is this ridiculously complicated that they fundamentally don't understand. Mm -hmm. Unless you're sitting across the table, Adam, having lunch every day and having the opportunity to let them ask you stupid questions, which they can do if they're asking me over lunch that they're not going to ask and they don't have the time to ask. And, and so I have had the good fortune of having a lot of legislators that started off very dubious, but giving me the time and being patient enough and then asking questions and, and legislators that are curious and they're like, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. You know, sit down and explain it to me like I'm five, right? Uh, that's the challenge is getting to the point where people are sufficiently educated to understand what is just baseless fear, uncertainty, and doubt, what are the genuine concerns, where this works and where this doesn't work well, where it's going to work better in the future, what it can and can't do, um, and then just be honest about it. That's the other thing that, you know, I, I hope I've developed a reputation I feel I have in the legislature of being very candid and honest with my colleagues, where if they, the governor asked me a question last year at one point, and he was like, you know, Chris, can you assure me there won't be any problems on this? I'm like, of course not. <laughs> How would I possibly assure you of that? But what I can say is that we drafted this legislation really well so that if and when there are problems, I, I think we put some good, um, good backstops in place to provide protection. And, and those are the kinds of things that, that help to engender that belief and support, just, just being patient and explaining and, and having the capacity to go into detail uh, to be honest about the good and the bad. And again, I think you pointed out, Richard, that, you know, it is a roller coaster and you have to be dispassionate in some ways about the fact that the tech, not that, that the value does go up and down, that there is volatility and, and be able to explain why um, they, a lot of, you know, there was a lot of education, educational messaging over the last couple of years, just about, why there is that volatility relative to, I, I mentioned the Wyoming stable token concept, it, trying to provide some education to my colleagues in, all right, well, what's the difference between a stable token and uh, a traditional um, non-backed coin and talking about volatility there. So it comes down to that informal education and the patience to 
provide that. And I, you know, I've had same discussions with family members, as you mentioned, and um, sitting down, drawing little pictures on pieces of paper. And <laughs> yeah, well, one, one of the biggest challenges I have is I, I have people tell me it's not real money. Oh, it's like, well, do you think the money that's in your wallet, the paper yeah. money, do you think that's real money? I'm like, it, it's all computerized. It's all ones and zeros. And it's that's, like, you have to detach yourself from the idea of physical money. Yeah. And, and it is, it's a great, it's a great discussion. And, and we've all had that anybody that's, that's dealing in cryptocurrency space, it comes back to the, well, why is this valuable? And then of course, the same question I ask is what you asked. Well, why is a dollar valuable? It's not asset backed. There's nothing there. There's no there there. We've all agreed to believe it has value. It, it had gold backing it well, at one point. And then the question then becomes, well, why do we value gold? Because we believe we want to. Um, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's an agreement system effectively. And, and if we agree it has value and, and we want to use it as a currency of exchange, we can, if we want to asset, that's a nice thing, at least with, with digital assets is you can asset back a digital asset in any way you feel like. Really great question. Um, I was joking I, around with a, I'm here? sorry. Uh, so I have, a, I have a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna fire them at you real quick. Uh, first of all, would you like to come out and speak at MIT Bitcoin Expo? Oh, sure. Really? As long as they don't have a conflict, yeah. Uh, it's a weekend of, uh, first weekend in May, I think seven and eight. Oh, well, that's really soon. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, uh, send, me, send me an email and I'll check, I'll check my schedule. Um, is there any other way to contact you? I don't use email. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, you, cell phone is fine. I'll give that to you. Uh, Could you just send me send it to me and I'll have the... Um, yeah, Ari, will you will you get her my contact info? Yeah, I can telegram it to you, Marina. Yeah, thanks. There you go, perfect. Uh, the other question I have for you is, so a day before yesterday, I spoke with a friend of mine who used to be our president, who basically single-headedly designed CBDC, well, at least what it is right now. It's not CBDC, but the preliminary, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and he said to me something interesting that it's becoming so political that now they're trying to move it out of CBDC to the treasury department. I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about it because it mind boggled me that, and I'm not very often speechless, believe me. But at that moment of time when he said it, I'm like, I couldn't respond. Well, it, it gets back to what I was saying a few minutes ago. I, my concerns about CBDCs are that they're used to manipulate and for political purposes, as opposed to simply functionalizing a fiat currency into blockchain space. I mean, there's so much value to having value assets on blockchain so that we can transact using smart contracts and other you know, faster, better, more secure, more provable, uh, trustless transactions. So I'm, I'm happy to see currencies, fiat currencies go into that space. Again, that's why I was, I, we passed this legislation on, on the Wyoming stable token, same justification. But if it goes to the treasury department so that they can effectively manipulate it, freeze it, uh, recall it, reverse it, the, there's real concerns with that. And I'm not saying, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there's, there's probably... I know there's a lot of mo motivation and desire to have, if it were a US Federal Reserve currency, CBDC, I think they want reversibility of transaction, which will be a little mucky. Um, well, it's not, it's not just that, but what, what scares me that tomorrow they say, this week you bought too many sugary drinks, we're gonna take away 10% of your money. Yeah. Or whatever have, else they choose to do, because it's all right. gonna be on there. And so in lieu of that, I was going to ask you is, do you have any advice on how to, uh, because Hester is coming to the Bitcoin Expo, so I'll see her pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way to, and, and I don't have as much patience as you do, but is there any way to advocate the use of zero knowledge proofs to have more privacy in CBDC or God yeah. forbid, goes to the treasury, whatever, whatever, whatever. 
Well, I think that's just it. it it's advocating for privacy. There, there's trade-off here. And I, there's trade-offs here. I have this conversation all the time in, in the Wyoming legislature on the floor. I'm a big privacy advocate. Um, privacy is horribly inconvenient for government. Every bit of privacy you have just holds government back, right? If, if we could just know everything all of you were doing all the time, 24-7, 365, it'd be so much easier to govern you, right? But, uh, you know, but, there's great books about that. <laughs> but if the government really want to, the, the, does the legislatures really want to, the whole world to know how many sugary drinks or cigarettes or alcohol or legal pot or whatever they right. use every day or how many bribes they, you know, have taken or given or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's that's just it. Yes. It, when you're when you're the policymaker and you need a solution because people are complaining to you, hey, we've got this problem. This really annoys us. We hate this. Please stop it. Then you find out that the, the way to do that ends up being to invade people's privacy and know more about what they do so that you can stop them from doing it. And it comes down to and I've honestly seen this in recent years. Oddly enough, I feel like people's privacy motivation, their passion for privacy has diminished in recent years. A lot of that's probably uh, social media. People are, are volunteering all their information themselves. They feel like the cat's out of the box already. And uh, as a result, this the passion that we had a decade ago and, and longer for our privacy rights seemed, seems to have eroded. So that provides opportunity then for uh, governments, ours and others to then fill that gap. And I'm finding that all the time in the Wyoming legislature. And honestly, we're, we're a pretty privacy focused state. And I still fight that frequently. Uh, so that's the thing that I think needs to be emphasized. And this community needs to try and reinvigorate that desire for privacy and, and the respect for privacy, where it, it is a fundamental constitutional right, where the treasury knowing how much sugar you drank it's just not there right there's no that that power is not um an expressed power so we need to emphasize that and we need to elect accordingly probably as well thank you yep i think we have time for one more question I'm going to ask since nobody is asking. Uh, do you think it might be possible uh, maybe for you and somebody on the other side of the aisle in Wyoming to create like an hour of educational video for the rest of the legislators? So I don't have to, since I don't have as much patience as you do, I don't have to start banging my head against the wall from the very beginning. And I'm sure it would help Ari in her work as well I, I... yeah, yeah I, cool. I think that's a good idea and i don't think it would be that challenging to put something together and you know again former representative lindholm who's now with senator lummis's office and i spent a lot of time doing that and that, that does get back to the reason why we we were able to build trust and confidence in the Wyoming legislature again because we we are different political parties uh different um different backgrounds and and for us to both be you know uniformly supportive of these ideas provided an awful lot of i guess you could say confidence by all of the members that they weren't missing something right and and i i do think marina that would be a valuable way to go about providing an education would be to have it be bipartisan um you know we we, we <laughs> Tyler always talked about how we were a good good road show when we'd go places together because uh, it, it was it was hard to you know anybody could think either one of us was crazy but it was hard to think we were both crazy at the same time. I mean that's why I asked that way yeah. because if I if I talk to Marjorie and I say oh no 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 that's a Republicans think that way right so I want to show them it's not a, you know a partisan issue and they're actually some you know, true Democrats who also think that way, who have spent an enormous amount of effort and energy thinking 
it through to a minuscule detail that it's not just a farce. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I think it would be very valuable, and I I do. I when I see you know when I see folks in 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 my party that are coming out against it, I I, I certainly want to spend time with them, and I know the same thing for my colleagues that that it it it's just perfectly consistent with a multitude of philosophies. And in fact, if you're not behind, if you're not behind overall digital assets, blockchain and, and, and crypto at this point in time, uh, it's probably because you have a vested interest in the existing institutions and financial institutions, and, and you're trying to preserve your own assets and wealth. I mean, because it, other than that, I just don't see a reason why this doesn't make life better. So if you're, I hope do, if you come out, you repeat that phrase from the stage. <laughs> the rest of the legislature can hear that, not from me, but from, from elected official who has worked on it numerous hours. Yeah, and I, I really do believe that. Yeah. Well, lots of great ideas being presented here, and uh, I'll make sure I connect Marina and uh, Chris, uh, Senator, you guys together, and um, I guess just. Um, Another quick question is um, a lot of folks will like look at Wyoming as the cowboy state and kind of dismiss the activities out. It's those cowboy states. We're more serious over here. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, I think they thought that early and I think they stopped and now they're all kind of copying our legislation and pasting it. Um, but it really does come down to the fact that we we're nimble and capable of being responsive and one of the things for large states you have this mass and inertia of of policy that is incredibly hard to shift and overcome you have so many vested interests that disruptive change is hard in that type of a situation it's incredibly challenging for us, disruptive change is a little bit easier. Although, as I said, I'm a little bit frustrated that we didn't pass the Wyoming Stable Token Act. And the reason we didn't was because it was just a little bit too disruptive for some of our executive branch folks. Mm -hmm. uh, so even we have limits, but we'll keep pushing and we'll bring that back. And uh, I just wish I'd had time to override the veto because we would have. It's just we ran out of time. Mm -hmm. I, I, had enough, I had enough votes in both chambers to override the veto, but the way our system works, um, it was past our veto override deadline, basically. Um, so the, the key is, you know, leadership is going to come from where you're capable of leading. And right now, uh, it isn't necessarily always going to be the large states that, that can lead because they struggle to be innovative. California and Texas and Florida, they can't be very innovative right now. They just, they don't have the capacity to innovate. Uh, Wyoming does, and and your some of your other smaller states are more nimble, and are I think are capable of being innovative and forward looking through legislation and through their legislatures. And and you know I, I do believe in the concept that state legislatures are the engines of innovation for the country, and that states can look to each other but the Fed should be looking to the states for the best ideas. And we've been fortunate so far not to be authoritatively preempted because everything really that's come out from the Feds so far through legislation, I think would have been disastrous. I don't, I, no, no exceptions are really coming to mind. So it's, it's good that they've just put those back in the drawer. Um, we'll, we'll see what, what comes forward in, in the near future, but uh we can take a good bit of pride, I think, in being the, the cowboy state. And uh, if people want to call us cowboys, I think we're happy with that. <laughs> it's not just that. It's also that you, you said it so correctly. This is where you want my attention is you can't rely on, you cannot be a putler of America and rely on, or, or, on being a, a, a gas station of America. And so you don't have much of a choice. You have to find something else where we in Mark Massachusetts could re just rely on colleges. We don't need anything else. Absolutely. We, yeah. You know, we have a hundred colleges that everybody wants to come. Why do we need anything else? And yeah. we have biotech, and we have the, the world leaders in biotech. Every every vaccine right. was developed on my street. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I 
I wish we could just coast like Massachusetts, but now we've got to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Senator Rothbus, for uh, joining us. It's been really, really Absolutely. enlightening and uh, really love um, all the things that you had shared with us. And thank you to our community for joining us today. I uh, love your questions and enthusiasm and also uh, professional love for the Senator here. I'm sure he enjoyed it too. Um, if the folks want to get in touch with you, do you do Twitter? Are you on yes, I do. Um, I'm just at Rothfuss on most everything. Rothfuss. And yeah. And then I'm uh, my legislative address is Chris at Rothfuss at wildledge.gov. But yes, are you also on Telegram at, at Rothfuss? I probably am. Yes, I think that's what I am on. Telegram. So my name is question mark, just so you don't get spooked out. Question mark. OK, nothing else. <laughs> I mean, you know, nothing could go wrong with just a random telegram from question mark. That sounds fully legit. <laughs> yeah. You know how many questions I ask, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you at Rothfuss. Uh, we'll be following you all on Twitter. And uh, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. And happy Friday and happy April, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Great conversation. You. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ari. Ari. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Windshield Time, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is a non-technical, fun, informative way to learn about money, Bitcoin, blockchains, crypto, and digital assets for busy parents and working folks who are curious about these new technologies. Day, Ari, and their guests talk about these evolutionary systems of money and what they do, y'all. Because what part of your life does money not touch? This podcast is not financial advice, and your reactions are your total and complete responsibility, y'all. Now, thanks again, and enjoy the show. What are you doing? Stuck in sack.